Uh, good morning, gentlemen. My name is Kevin Booker. I'm the Associate Dean of Student Life and one of the co-chairs of the Student Development Committee. The other co-chair is Dr. Brian Marks. I am going to introduce one of our speakers for today, and she will share an introduction of one of our other speakers. Uh, the speaker that I am introducing is Dr. Nina L. Gilbert. She is the founder and senior advisor and chief visionary officer of the Ivy Prep Foundation, an Ivy Prep network of charter schools. Dr. Gilbert launched Georgia's first single gender charter school for girls in 2008. Under her leadership, Ivy Prep experienced tremendous growth and now operates three single gender charter schools serving over 1,200 students throughout Metro Atlanta. Dr. Nina Gilbert has been selected as a participant in two prestigious national fellowships. She is a 2006 Building Excellent Schools Fellow and a 2013 Education Fellow of Farah Aspen Institute. She has been recognized and profiled by Rolling Out Magazine, Maybelline Cosmetics, CNN, Fox, Mike Huckabee Show, Essence Magazine, the Atlanta Business League, as one of Atlanta's 100 Women of Influence, and was recently recognized by TheRoot.com as a Class Act Educator. Gilbert has also received an Outstanding Citizen Award from the NAACP and Georgia's Secretary of State for her community service and contributions to public education. Dr. Gilbert holds a master's degree in educational leadership from Clark Atlanta University and a doctorate degree in education from the University of Pennsylvania. Because of Dr. Gilbert's unique and challenging journey as an educator and pioneer in her field, she is frequently invited to speak at national conferences, community and civic events, and is considered as a national thought leader in the area of urban education reform. She has also served as an adjunct professor and is currently the senior advisor on education reform for the Morehouse Research Institute. Through her role as an educational consultant, advisor, and coach, she continues to serve children and families by supporting education leaders and organizations throughout the country. She is, the more, she is also the mother of a Morehouse graduate of the class of 2012. At this time, let's give Dr. Nina L. Gilbert a round of applause. Good morning, men of Morehouse. It's good to see you all. I'm so happy to be here with you this morning. Uh, it gives me great pleasure and it's my distinct honor to introduce to you a friend and fellow educator and a fearless leader here in Atlanta, uh, Courtney English. Uh, Courtney English is the chairman of the Atlanta Public Schools uh, Board of Education. He was elected in 2009 at only 24 years of age. Courtney is the youngest person to be elected citywide in any capacity in the city of Atlanta's history and is the first full-time public schools teacher ever to be elected to the Board of Education. So I wrote in my notes that you all would uh, give him a hand at that point. <laughs> Thank you. You're so good. Um, since taking office, Courtney has championed school autonomy, increased rigorous course offerings throughout the district, overhauled the teacher evaluation system, fought to give parents more options for their kids, and instituted a number of policies to clean up years of administrative mismanagement, including a widespread cheating scandal. Applaud again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, additionally, Courtney has worked to build public-private partnerships to address the city's dropout crisis. To date, his efforts have generated over $2.5 million in additional resources and have resulted in the launch of Atlanta's first dropout prevention and recovery program. As chairman, chairperson of the Board's Accountability Commission, he has served as the, one of the chief architects of APS's five-year strategic plan. Courtney has fought to ensure the equitable distribution of resources to Atlanta's neediest students and has grown the system's reserves from $44 million to over $90 million and put the district on... Okay, yep. <laughs> I didn't have to ask that time. 
has grown the reserves from $44 million to over $90 million, and he's put the district on track to pay down its unfunded pension fund liability after decades of neglect. Prior to his election, Courtney was a founding teacher at Best Academy, the first all-male school in the city of Atlanta, and he actually taught 7th grade social studies in the same room where he took 7th grade social studies as a student. During his time in the classroom, over 80% of Courtney's students met or exceeded their learning objectives. Courtney also serves as a grade level chairperson and still serves as a coach of both the football team and the championship baseball teams. <laughs> Outside of the boardroom, Courtney has worked as a strategy and development consultant for various nonprofit organizations, focused on education, and has led the Morehouse College Pre-Freshman Summer Program, which is designed to prepare African-American males for college. Quickly becoming a thought leader in education, Courtney is frequently a guest lecturer at Emory University, Spelman College, Morehouse College, and Harvard University. He has also presented at various conferences on education, including the National School Boards Association Annual Conference, the Council of Urban Boards of Education, and various programs for Teach for America. Courtney is a native Atlantan and a proud graduate of Frederick Douglass High School. He is a graduate of Morehouse College, where he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in political science. And he's also a graduate of Teachers College, Columbia University, with a Master of Arts in Organizational Psychology. Courtney is a member of the LEAD Atlanta class of 2011 and serves on the boards of various nonprofit organizations, including the National Center for Global Engagement, Child First USA, and the Morehouse College Center for Teacher Preparation Advisory Board. Please put your hands together and join me in welcoming the... Uh, wonderful chairman of the Atlanta Board of Education, Mr. Courtney English. Good morning, gentlemen. How's everyone this morning? Awesome. Good. Great. Uh, it's definitely a, a pleasure to be uh, here at Crown Forum, uh, more importantly, it's a pleasure to be home at uh, Morehouse College. Obviously, this morning, we're going to have a critical uh, conversation about education in this country, uh, an issue that has affected and impacted every person in this room. Um, and we have with us one of the foremost uh, thought leaders, revolutionaries in the fight to ensure that kids who look like the majority of kids sitting out here in this audience have access to a high quality education, Dr. Howard Fuller. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who he is and what he's done, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that's important, if that's all right. Howard Fuller's career includes many years in both public service positions and the field of education. Dr. Fuller is a distinguished professor of education and founder slash director of the Institute for Transformation of Learning at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, the mission of the Institute is, is to support exemplary education options that transform learning for children, while empowering families, particularly low-income families, to choose the best options for their children. Immediately before his appointment at Marquette, Dr. Fuller served as a superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools from June 1991 through June 1995. Dr. Fuller became nationally known for his unending support for fundamental educational reform. Dr. Fuller received his BS degree in sociology from Carroll College, a master's degree in social administration from Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and his PhD in sociological foundations of education from Mar Marquette University. He's received numerous awards and recognitions over the years, including four honorary doctorate degrees, Doctor of Humane Letters from Carroll College, Doctor of Laws from Marion College, uh, Wisconsin, Doctorate of Business and Economics from Milwaukee School of Engineering, and Doctorate of Humane Letters from Edgewood, Edgewood College. He is chair of the board of the Black Alliance for Educational Options and Milwaukee Collegiate Academy. He also serves on the board of the Milwaukee Region Board for Teach for America, Milwaukee Charter Schools Advocates, and the CEE Trust. 
He is an advisory board member of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools and the National Association for Charter School Authorizers. So we have before us a guy who really, all it really means is he really, really knows what he's talking about. He really does. Anybody ever seen the movie Way for Superman? A couple of people. Dr. Fuller was, uh, along with a, another good friend of mine, was uh, featured in that movie Waiting for Superman for his efforts in education reform. But all of that being said, let me tell you why that's important. So uh, as, as Nina, Dr. Gilbert, my good friend, I appreciate you for the introduction, just alluded to, I'm a proud graduate of the Atlanta Public Schools. Um, you know, I, I, I've been elected, got elected at the ripe old age of 24 years old. Uh, this past January, this past December, November rather, I was re-elected uh, to a citywide seat on the Atlanta Board of Education. This past January, my colleagues saw fit to make me the chair of the Atlanta Public Schools Board of Education, which is a, almost a $2 billion organization. I'm the youngest person at 29 years old to ever hold that, that position. All that means is that I had a high quality education. But despite all of that, you know, I grew up two minutes away from where you all sit now in the West End. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I was never actually able to attend the school in my neighborhood. You see, the school in my neighborhood was not only one of the lowest performing schools in the Atlanta public school system, it was one of the lowest performing schools in the entire state of Georgia. Now, the state of Georgia battles uh, between 48th and 49th in terms of education nationally in a country that's about 25th in the world. So that tells you the quality of education that was available to me in my own neighborhood. You see, my mom had a choice. She could have either sent me to that low-performing school in the neighborhood, or she could have fought to send, me, uh, to send me to better schools across town. She chose to fight because she believed it was worth fighting for. Because of her fight, I ultimately got into uh, and graduated from Morehouse College, got into and graduated from Columbia University, and did all those wonderful things that Nina just uh, told you about. But none of that would have been possible, none of that would have been possible if it were not for the fight that my mom had with the school system. And simply put, no kid, no child, no parent should ever have to fight to get a high quality education. That's what every single child deserves. Simply put, Dr. Fuller is a man who has spent his life fighting to make sure kids like me, kids like you, kids like us, have access to a high quality education. So without further ado, I'll bring to you Dr. Howard Fuller. Thank you. I hope y'all like that. Yeah. So good morning. Uh, I know I'm supposed to say good morning, gentlemen of Morehouse. But I'm going to say good morning, brothers of Morehouse. And I also see a couple of young sisters in here. I want to recognize them, too. I don't know how they got in here, but I see them. And uh, I want to make sure I recognize them as well. So um, it is obviously an honor and a privilege for me to be standing before you all this morning. But before I get started with my speech, I got a commercial that I want you all to help me with. So. Um, I'm in a contest with this friend of mine to see who can get the most followers on Twitter. So I'm trying to crush this dude because, you know, he's talking. You know, he's, he's running his mouth. So I figured that I was going to be able to pick up some followers here this morning. So my Twitter handle is Howard L. Fuller. So I'm going to shamelessly ask you to follow me so I can do what I got to do with this friend of mine back home. And I also know that there's a bunch of brothers here. I don't know how many of you are, but I know there's a group of you all that came down here from Milwaukee. And so I know you're in here somewhere. If you're not in here, you're in trouble because you're supposed to be in here. So, uh, but I just want to recognize uh, that group of you who are here from Milwaukee. And i tell you how much I appreciate you all being here. So let me tell you all what this is really all about. Martin Luther King said that the central quality in black people's life is pain. And it's a pain that's so old and so deep that it shows in every moment of our existence that black people are laughing while shedding invisible tears that no hand can wipe away. 
in a highly competitive world, black people know that a cloud of persistent denial stands between us and the sun, between us and life and power, between us and whatever we need. In many cities and towns in this country, you all know and I know, black people are in pain. We don't have jobs, or when we do have jobs, they don't pay enough so that we can take care of our families. Our young men are being killed by people that are supposed to protect us while we killing each other. So many of us don't have proper health care, and the list goes on. But is there anything more painful than seeing our children not being educated, dropping out of school, being pushed out of school? How painful is it to have young people not being taught and not understanding that they are indeed young, gifted, and black? And I want to say to you all that this pain should not go on another day. This is America. We are supposed to be the greatest country in the world. How does that happen that our children are not being taught in America? So my talk this morning is going to focus on our children getting a quality education. And let me approach the discussion in another way. During the slavery period in the United States, all of the slave states had a code. And at the heart of every code was the requirement that slaves submit to their masters. For example, the Louisiana Code of 1806 proclaimed that the condition of a slave is a passive one. He's supposed to be subordinate to his master and all who represents the master. He owes to the master and the master's family a respect without bounds, an absolute obedience. And he is consequently to execute all of the orders he receives from the master or from the master's family. The purpose of this code was to do more than just teach slaves to be obedient. There's a book called Peculiar Institution by Kenneth Stamp. And chapter four, the the title of that chapter is Make Them Stand in Fear. So that the objective really was to make us stand in fear of our masters. But in addition to all of these general slave codes, there were specific codes that talked about education. And so in Savannah, for example, in 1818, they passed an ordinance that said that any person that teaches any person of color, slave or free, to read or write or even causes that person to be taught, they're going to be fined $30. Back in 1818, $30 was a lot of money. But if the person who did the teaching was black, then they not only were going to be fined, but they were going to be whipped with 39 lashes. We're no longer in slavery. It's no longer a crime to teach us to read and write. And since that is the case, why is it that so many of our kids cannot read or write today in America? If you think about it, those of you who are conscious, If you think about it, on February 1st, 1960, four students from A&T sat down at a lunch counter and demanded that we be served. Here we are in 2014, four students sit down at a lunch counter where they're welcome and can't read the menu. And you tell me, how did this happen in America? How did we allow this to happen in America. And so, as I go around the country speaking, people always ask me, why are you so mad? Why are you such an angry Negro? And I start out by saying, first of all, man, I'm mad because of what it is that's happening to us. 
But what makes me even madder is that we ain't mad. That as a people, we're not mad. We, we, we the most accommodating race of people on the face of the earth. We accept it. Hey, man, we too busy partying. I can't stop to think about this. I got to get to the club, man. I can't, I can't worry about this. This ain't about me. And so what I want to say is, how do we sit here 60 years after Brown won? 60 years. 59 years after Brown too, and see this happening to our children right here in America. We've always been a creative people. We developed ingenious ways to resist slavery. Our spirituals reflected the pain on earth, but it also let us know that Harriet Tubman's Underground Railroad had arrived. We used sit-ins, jail-ins, boycotts, all kinds of things to change the course of American history. We did all of these things because at one point in time, we were driven by a collective will, a collective value system that said we will not allow our people to be denied their God-given rights as human beings. We were driven by a belief structure that say that we owe something to the generation that came before us and the generation that is going to come after us. This is a strange point in our history, brothers. Because of the struggles in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and even the 90s, there are more opportunities that have opened up for us. Du Bois' talented 10th has never been in more evidence. We got black people at all levels of the political structure in this country. We got a biracial president of the United States. We got black millionaires. We got people who influence the cultural direction of the country and the world with our music and the way we dress. We got young men making millions of dollars for bouncing a ball, hitting a ball, tackling somebody who got a ball. And then they get millions of more for hawking t-shirts and tennis shoes, sweatshirts, and hoodies, and on and on and on. Yet while all of that is happening, not too far from here, there are young people not being educated, and all over this country, they're not being educated by thousands. And so the theme for this year's Crown Forum series, speaker series, is the year of responsibility. So the question I have for you all is, what is your responsibility given this reality? France Fanon, an Algerian revolutionary, wrote a book called Wretched of the Earth. And he said in this book that every generation out of relative obscurity must discover its mission and either fulfill it or betray it. What was the mission of black people during slavery? It was to fight against fear, dare to stand up as human beings, to learn to read and write even during slavery and pass those skills on to our children. What is the mission of black people today? I believe it is to fight against apathy and acceptance. It is to insist that our children be taught to read and write and analyze and compute and how to master all forms of technology and to think for themselves. You all are in this room today because at some level or another, Either you understood or your parents or somebody pushed you to understand that education was your pathway to liberation and freedom. Somebody got you up in here. Some of y'all just roll up in here maybe by accident. But you here. And you couldn't have been here without getting a certain level of education. There are thousands of young brothers like you who got no chance to come to Morehouse because they can't read, they can't write, they can't think, they can't compute, and they're not going to make it. You know how it is when these white folks run for office and they roll up in our churches or they come to Morehouse? One of the first things they do is they get up there and they tell y'all, it take a whole village to educate a child. 
Most of them ain't never been to the village, couldn't find the village with map quests. But they get up here telling you it take a whole village to educate a child. First of all, I'm tired of hearing about that village. So I read a book called The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman. Scariest book I've read in a long time. They got another parable I want to leave with you. It says that every day in Africa, a gazelle gets up. And a gazelle knows that if it can't run faster than the fastest lion, it's going to get killed. The lion gets up knowing that if it can't run faster than the slowest gazelle, it's going to starve. Either way, when the sun comes up, they both start running. And what's happening is every day in this world, young people are getting up all over the world, and they're running faster than our best young people. And if they're running faster than our best young people, what chance are our children going to have who can't read and can't write? The answer is no chance. And even some of y'all who think you all that, you're going to find out you ain't nearly all that. Because you got people out there who are working harder than us. Because even some of us who have got opportunity have become complacent. And we think we entitled that somehow the world just going to give us something. Some of y'all going to have a cold-blooded reality when you roll out of here and you find out that it ain't like that. Because I tell people all the time that education in America guarantees you nothing. But I'll guarantee you, you will have nothing without an education. So brothers, a great Egyptian sage, Hotep, said that freedom is not a place, rather it's a continuation of struggle. That freedom should not be viewed as a goal, rather it must be seen as a launching pad from which to reach our goals. Without purpose, freedom hardly matters. Freedom really don't make us free. Freedom just gives us a license to pursue our goals. Freedom is being shackled to identity, purpose, and direction, and being in constant pursuit. So we must be in constant pursuit to create quality schools for our children and our young people. And let me just make a point here, because we're talking about schools. But let's be really clear that so many things are happening to our young people before they ever get to the school. And that all of us in this room got to understand the impact of race and class on what it is that's happening in our communities. And I've heard that we're in a post-racial America, but I'm old, and I don't know what that means. But I'm sure that y'all know, and you know, after this, maybe some of y'all going to tell me what a post-racial America is. All I know is if you black, you got issues in America. But I know even more that if you poor, you got even more issues in America. I also know that children who are hungry cannot come to school and learn. Children who are being abused and neglected every day, it's hard for them to come to school and learn. Children need to see people in their immediate family working to understand the value of education and work. Because I want you all to think about this. Because, and I'm going to get to it in a minute. You know how people tell you that money don't matter? Everybody who say that got money. And, and no, no, nobody who, who, as Chris Rock say, don't got money, going to be rolling around in America talking about how cool it is to be broke in America. Money matters in America. And so what we got to clearly understand is this is not just a fight to improve education. It's a fight to improve the lives of our people. And education is an instrument to help 
with that larger struggle. So this is the challenge I want to put before you all. You can go two ways, just for discussion purposes. I see you all as the intelligentsia of an oppressed people. And there are two ways that you can go. Shelby Steele, if you read his book, Content of Our Character, he says that all of you educated brothers out here, about to be educated brothers, you ain't got no responsibility to these low-life Negroes who don't take advantage of what America has to offer. That if they suffering, it's because they didn't do everything that America gave them to do. You can have that attitude, or you can operate with the attitude that says, to those of us who much is given, much is required. And I would argue and hope that for most of you, that you're going to take the position that you are the, an advantaged group of black people. And you are. No matter how hard you work to get here, the fact that you're here means that you have advantages that a whole lot of black people will never have. And so the question is, how are you going to use that advantage? And so if the theory and if the theme of this series is responsibility, my question to you is, what responsibility do you have to use your intellect your capacity to help change the conditions for our children in schools, but to help change the conditions for our people in this country. I don't have to go through the history of this institution and who went through here, because I know people tell you that all the time. But the reality of it is, this is an institution with great history. This is an institution that have produced people who, who saw it as their role in life to help make it better for the masses of our people. And so the message that I have for you today is I hope you will take up that mantle. And so when the question of responsibility is raised, that you all will say, I have a responsibility to ensure that every single child is educated. And I have a responsibility to build an America where you can wear a hoodie and don't get shot just because you black and you got a hoodie. In America where we were with uh, Mrs. Macbeth uh, last night, her son, Jordan, was the one who was killed in Jacksonville, Florida, because all he did was have his music playing loud. And y'all know music ain't no good if you can't play it loud. You feel, if you ain't turning it up, it ain't good. And you, 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 you can't be killed in America because you got your music loud. We got to make America a different America. And years ago, there were people who were on this campus who made a commitment to make an America better. And I hope that that's the responsibility that you're going to accept. I thank you so much for this opportunity. All right, let's give Dr. Fuller another round of applause, please. Okay. Well, gentlemen, we've heard a lot of information. We've heard uh, some great words from our brother, Courtney English, uh, which talked a lot about responsibility, as well as from Dr. Fuller, about the importance of this opportunity you have now and the responsibilities associated with it. I want to challenge you. There are many ways that you can help affect change as you leave Morehouse. How many in you by show, how many of you in here by show of hands have an interest in teaching? Raise your hands. Okay. Very good. Give them a round of applause. All of the folks that you see on the stage to the left of me are educators and they started in the classroom. So there are many ways in which you can get affiliated with education here. Uh, if you are interested in education, 
You have the Morehouse Education Association, which is a student group here at the college. You have the Black Male Initiative, which has connections to many of the teaching opportunities that exist and career opportunities. I myself am a former administrator uh, and would love to talk to you about careers in education. So there are many employment opportunities, summer as well as full time. So I want to encourage you to do that. Also, Dr. Fuller has recently written a book. The book is entitled No Struggle, No Progress. It is available through uh, the Black Male Initiative. We have 50 copies, and we would like to issue those books out. So if you have an interest, at the end of the uh, Crown Forum, you'll, you will have the opportunity uh, to speak with one of us, and we'll make something happen for you. But again, 50, 50 copies of No Struggle, No Progress will be available to you. 